is the first black country. Come on now. The first black country in the post-World War II period to gain its independence, 14 months before Ghana. January the 1st, who you, uh, Mr. Cook's always a commemorated. January the 1st, 1956, where it's Zara. Uh, but at that time, they didn't realize the people in the South had a beef. And as a result of that, that war has been going on longer than anything that's going on in Africa, with over 3 million people killed. We can't have a situation where, where Zimbabwe, Angola, Namibia, three countries that fought for their liberation. Naturally, the people who fought on a battlefield took out white people's lives, you know, killed them, you know, and along with the Cubans, actually was able to win that battle. And of course, one of the things we have to remember as a people, and I want to just put this out to you because we've been talking about it a lot. But, uh, August the 13th is going to be Fidel Castro's 80th birthday. I think a salute from the black community is definitely something we need to do. Change the course of the course of the world, change the course of Africa. And when they left, they said, you can't say anything about us, nigga. We didn't have one uh, coffee plantation. We didn't have one oil well. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have any dying lines. The only thing we brought home to us when we went back to Cuba was the, 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 the bodies of our comrades who fell and bloody in Angola. Now, and when you have a person who is up, who you see every day, Bush is now down to 34%. Should be about 10. <laughs> because he is a person who is one of the most, it's not, it's not even so much him, he's a tool by people who are using him and I mean, Cheney. How is Cheney able to get away with what he's doing? You know, I mean, he's he, he, he can be making money in the Gulf, in the Middle East, letting them make money in the, in the Louisiana Gulf. And if any, any territory here, that black people have a prime reason to actually intervene is Louisiana. Right. Because it had not been for the Africans in Haiti giving Napoleon such a beating that he had to sell the Louisiana Purchase, which allowed for them to then double the size of this country and then make it move over to the Pacific Coast Anything they're gonna do against Haiti, you know, is something that we always have to rise to. And Louisiana, New Orleans, is gonna be one of the biggest gentrification cases you have ever seen. That's what they have planned. And those of us who are up in Harlem, we know where in Brooklyn, we know what it's all about. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that these things are all together. We have to be strong ourselves so that we can strengthen Africa. We have to do that. We cannot go any further without understanding that the Africans in the West, in the, in the, in the diaspora, have to be inextricably intertwined into the Africans at, uh, at home. And the fact is that that is why it is a sixth uh, 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 region. Because they were not looking at that. We had to be all for years, over 50 years, we've been trying to say, look, you have to recognize the Africans in the West. You have, but they said they couldn't do it because you know we're you not a state, you don't have a country. But now they understand. I believe too that if, if several more African leaders had went with Tabo and Becky on January first, when they celebrated their 200th anniversary, that the United States would never have intervened because they would know that Africa was together. Yeah. So brothers, sisters, comrades, and friends, what I'm trying to say to you is that this particular thing that uh, 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 Menelik has put together is bigger than even when you thought. Because if it, if it was known to the people, you could not get in this place. The demand that what we're talking about right now, this place should have been flooded with people all wanting to know how to get down, what's the, what are the marching orders, how we're gonna do the economic piece, how we're gonna do the cultural piece, and how we're gonna do the political piece, and maybe how we're gonna do the military piece. Thank you very much.
reading Region 6. <laughs> Dr. John Henry Clark uh, had many things that we remember him for, and uh, they're in the form of uh, quotations that we make. One uh, of his most powerful is that it is possible to continue to oppress a consciously historical people. Dr. Clark also, uh, in his last book, which is yet to be published, stated the mission of our gathering here today. And that book's title is Pan-Africanism or Perish. In other words, there's no other choice. Um, one of the problems, and I think that uh, what I can do is to amplify some of the things that went on yesterday and what has already been said here, um, one of the problems is that we don't have that definition as a people, in part because we don't see ourselves as a people. That, uh, and so the crisis of consciousness, as Anderson Thompson has said, is our crisis. Some people have, as he said, the Asians have uh, one crisis, the Europeans have another. Some have land, some have resources, but Africans have the, the, the uh, crisis of consciousness. And um, it makes us um, pick the wrong targets or pick the wrong emphasis. For example, we just had the um, uh, covenant meeting uh, the other night on uh, television. And I want to say everything positive I can about the covenant meeting. However, it's limited uh, because that covenant is a covenant with the United States. <laughs> In other words, it was not an African covenant with African people. That's the covenant that we need to make, the covenant with each other. <laughs> if we learn anything from Katrina, we should learn that there's a limit to whatever agreement can be gotten from a covenant. To have Africans lying on rooftops for almost a week waiting for someone to come because they had trust and faith in a structure that someone would come to deliver them is almost the same as hoping to have a covenant from the same people and expecting them to live up to the covenant, which has never uh, happened before. And so what I want to do is to uh, uh, amplified by reference to some quotations that come from uh, a book that was written by, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, called Chess The Grand Chessboard. Yes, and um, some people read The Grand Chessboard. Unfortunately, it's not read widely enough. But uh, those who read it sometimes skip the main part. <laughs> and I just wanted to pull some of these quotes out and make a couple comments in light of the fact that we here don't have to be told that this struggle at its core is a cultural struggle. Uh, that the cultural struggle is, it actually uh, prefigures the military struggle and the economic struggle. And the fact that those who currently intend to rule the world know that, and that's what the grand chessboard says. And I pick it also because Brzezinski was on the Democratic side. If you wanted to hear this from the Republican or right-wing side, you'd pick the book, uh, the, Cra the Clash of Civilizations by Huntington, who was the person that Bush went to to explain how to win in the Middle East immediately after 911. And I'm not gonna take the time to go into Huntington's way of describing the world. Uh, because you'll get part of it from the left. <laughs> In other words, there's not that much difference between the right and the left. There's really only one force that's intending to control the earth. And in uh, Brzezinski's book, it says, and this is written in 1997, 
so this is long before 9-11. Eurasia is thus the chessboard on which the struggle for global primacy continues to be played. And that struggle involves geostrategy, the strategic management of geopolitical interests. It is imperative on this chessboard that no Eurasian challenger emerges. And notice the, the challenger was not there. There was nobody to fly planes in the buildings at this time. But they said there should be no challenger emerging capable of dominating Eurasia and thus also challenging America, dominance in the Middle East. <coughs> then he goes to history and says Rome's imperial power, however, was also derived from an important psychological reality. They say, I am a Roman citizen, and that was the highest possible self-definition, a source of pride and aspiration for many. Eventually, that citizenship was even given to people who were not of Roman birth. And so the exalted status of the Roman citizen was an expression of cultural superiority that justified empirical, and imperial power's sense of mission it not only legitimated Rome's rule, but it also inclined those subject to it to desire assimilation and inclusion in the imperial structure. And then this line, cultural superiority taken for granted by the rulers, conceded by the subjugated, thus reinforced imperial power. So the source of power is in their eyes and in reality culture. And it gets even more interesting. The overseas British Empire was initially acquired through a combination of exploration, trade, and conquest. But much like the Roman and Chinese predecessors or its French and Spanish rivals, it also derived a great deal of its staying power from the perception of British cultural superiority. Cultural superiority successfully asserted and quietly conceded had the effect of reducing the need to rely on large military forces to maintain the power of the imperial center. By 1914, only a few thousand British military personnel and civil servants control 11 million square miles of almost 400 million non-British subjects. Because of these domestic factors, the American global system emphasizes the technique of co-optation, as in the case of the defeated rivals, Germany, Japan, and even lately Russia, and to a much greater extent than the earlier imperial system did. It likewise relies heavily on the indirect exercise of influence on dependent foreign elites, while drawing much benefit from the appeal of its democratic principles and institutions. By the way, democracy is a code word that means imperialism. <laughs> All of the foregoing are reinforced by the massive but intangible impact of American domination of global communications, popular entertainment, and mass culture. Global communication, popular entertainment, where we play a huge role, and mass culture, where we play a huge role. <coughs> And by, the very, and by the potentially very tangible cloud of America's technological edge and, of course, the, backed up by the global military reach. But the central thrust is not the military, it's the culture. Cultural domination has been an unappreciated facet of American global power. Now you remember, Brzezinski was President Carter's national security advisor. So this is why, in case, I hadn't said that at the outset, why I'm taking this time. These are not 
some social scientist in a university writing things just for his friends. But these are people who, who actually shape uh, the thrust of power and achievement. In addition, one must consider the part of the American system, the global web of specialized organizations, especially the international financial institutions. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, can be said to represent global interest and their constituency may be construed as the world. In reality, however, they are heavily American dominated and their origins are traceable to American initiatives particularly the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. American supremacy has produced a new international order that, notice we're not talking about democracy, that we're importing supposedly to the rest of the world. We're talking about domination and control and the vehicle for domination and control uh, explicitly. Uh, replicate these institutions, financial and others, replicate and institutionalize abroad many of the features of the American system itself, including a collective security system, that is NATO, Japanese security and so forth, regional economic co uh, cooperation, including the World Bank, World Trade Organization, procedures that emphasize consensual decision making, even if dominated by the United States, a preference for democratic membership within key alliances, and a rudimentary global constitutional and judicial structure ranging from the world court to a special tribunal to try Bosnian war crime. All of these things as vehicles of control. And then skipping, in that context, uh, the, for America, the chief geopolitical prize is Eurasia. For half a millennium, world affairs were dominated by Eurasian powers and peoples who fought one another for regional domination and reached out for global power. Now a Eurasian power is prominent in Eurasia, and America's global primacy is directly dependent on how long and how effectively its preponderance on the Eurasian continent is sustained. Um, <laughs> the next one is gonna be very interesting. In that context, how America manages Eurasia is critical. Eurasia is the globe's largest continent and geopolitically axial. A power that dominates Eurasia will control two of the world's three most advanced and economically productive regions. A mere glance at the map also suggests that control over Eurasia would almost automatically entail Africa's subordination. I repeat, a control over Asia, over Eurasia, would almost automatically entail Africa's subordination. Europe is America's natural ally. It shares the same values partakes in the main of the same religious heritage, practices the same democratic politics, and is the original homeland of a large majority of Americans. It follows that America's primary interest is to help ensure that no single power comes to control in this geopolitical space and that the global community has unhindered financial and economic access to this region. And then the last thing I'll say, as, uh, as we looked at that covenant, uh, we saw that it was first and foremost not global. It was US bound, which meant that it left almost all the Africans in the world out. Secondly, it placed emphasis on trust and an agreement with the United States government to promise and deliver. Third, it requested the government for subsistence needs without a future plan for development needs. So what we asked for wasn't much at all, mostly civil rights and uh, not even reparations, which is the fourth, that it did not deal with reparations. And then it does not call for a covenant with Africans themselves. If we understand what John Henry Clark was telling us with his entire life, it is impossible 
to continue to oppress a culturally historical people and Pan-Africanism or perish. Spiritual base. 
And there were those who were around Malcolm that said, we really don't need that. But Malcolm insisted on Muslim Mosque Incorporated because Malcolm felt that in this struggle there should be a spiritual base. Now I'm going to try to stick to my point on business, the spirit of doing business in Africa, uh, Minister Menelik, and I want to thank you for inviting me. But it's difficult to be here and not bring some of these issues up. And I also will make a gallant attempt to stick to the 15 minutes that I've been given, knowing that Muslim ministers are very long-winded, okay? When you come to hear a Muslim minister preach, you need to bring coffee and your lunch so you can make it through it. But let me try to say this um, as quickly as possible. First, I'm, and I have to say this before you speak, uh, Representative uh, Charles Barron from New York. Yesterday I was in uh, St. Louis and uh, Barack Obama, who I talked to about going to Kenya and his father, and his father, you know his name, you know he's a Muslim by Barack Obama, okay? But his father, Hussein, who was a Muslim brother who came from Kenya, married a white American girl, and he's, uh, he was in St. Louis. And I have to say this and I'm gonna move quickly. Uh, after we got there, there was a woman who was running for Senate. Barack Obama was there raising money. And this woman was going to a little city of Corpus Christi to raise money. And the man she was going to raise money for was a real Texas high roller. Corpus Christi is where Cheney shooting up in the air shot his friend, okay, in the face. But uh, it's a very powerful old place with very wealthy people. Now here's a woman from Missouri going to this small town because they're going to raise money to put her in the U.S. Senate because her overall feeling and philosophy is important to them to get her in the Senate. And we have to feel the same way about a brother who is conscious about Africa. It can't be, let me just say this quickly, it can't be limited to New York, uh, Elon May. He has to be able to go around this country and find conscious communities that will put enough money and resources so that we can outdo Ed Towns you're running against, right? Ed Towns has no African consciousness. And if we're going to have a man in there that understands us, understands Africa, then across this country, he can't be limited to New York and New Jersey to raise money. It's got to be all over this country, and it has to be well organized. I have to slip that in. And being that the Nation of Islam has a reputation of organizing, and knowing that if we organize out front with him, the uh, Zionist community in New York will beat the hell out of him and try to take the white folks that he would automatically get because of his notoriety. But we gotta know how to do things behind the scene and don't have ego that we have to be seen all the time. Now let me try to get to this quickly. The most important things, you know, when you study uh, Hegel and Nietzsche, they met really spread in very small groups. They didn't have big groups and big audiences. But what they came up with affected the masses of people. Now, if we are Afrocentric and conscious about Africa, and we know we're convinced in our hearts and soul that that's the direction that we have to point our people, then we gotta work on it. We can't, we have to come out with it. You know, a think tank may be good, but if nothing implemented after that tank, think tank, it goes to North. One thing that I wrote at the top of my paper is Dr. Martin Luther King in Africa. I found a book, you know, I have this great love of book and I thank God for Malcolm because he never taught without mentioning a book, holding a book up. And he encouraged us to read when I was a very young Muslim. Um, I found a book about Dr. Martin Luther King. Now every year, January 15th, April the 4th, we celebrate Martin Luther King. The conscious African community Knowing that King is loved and respected throughout the world have to tie him to Africa. His source of inspiration was in Africa. Now King, after he had worked, January of 1957, the church told him, take a vacation. They showed him how much money came in, and they said, you need to go to Europe. All of them were telling him to go to Europe. And King said, isn't some country in Africa going to have some independence? And it was, it was Ghana. So what King said, maybe uh, I should go to Ghana. He, his uh, Coretta was pregnant with Marty III. You don't like Marty, but Martin Luther King III. She was pregnant with him at that time. So there's an African kind of destiny in him, okay? And I, when I met him in Nigeria, and he came to Abiola's uh, 
reparations conference, his first trip to Africa, it was an enlightening period for him. But let me say this quickly. I'm from New York and I talk fast, but I want you to pick up on this. So when our children come, and our children want to talk about Martin Luther King, you know, and they, I, he had a dream and this and that and, you know, the integration and so forth, and he was a great civil rights leader. Tell the, kid, the children that Martin Luther King made a trip to Africa in March of 1957. That Kwame Nkrumah, who was in America, and saw this tremendous potential of black Americans. And if he could only wed them to Africa and use the training that white folks gave us in America, that he could help to build Africa. And that was his lifelong desire, to wed the Africans in the diaspora with the African continent. So he invited Martin Luther King. So my, Martin Luther King got on the plane to New York with Adam Clayton Powell, uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph Bunch. Richard Nixon. Who was it? Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, they got on the plane. And who? And John Johnson, thank you. See, I have to go to the Long Bay. You know, they got on the plane. Listen, and most people don't know that this is written in a book. You'd be surprised what's in a book. And they got on a plane in New York, and they stopped in Lisbon, Portugal, and they flew into a crowd down. And so Kwame Nkrumah invited all of those who engaged in the liberation struggle. And if you get with Elamba, he'll tell you the people who were at the independence of Ghana. Uh, I talked to Dr. Robert Lee, who Dr. Kwame Nkrumah met at the uh, Lincoln University, and him and his wife, Sarah and Robert Lee, moved to Ghana when they finished school because Dr. Kwame Nkrumah encouraged them. And I'll never forget how Dr. Lee told me he went to a church meeting one night, and they had this African speaking on the campus. <laughs> and it was Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and he said his mind was completely blown. He knew nothing about Africa, and he came to Africa, but he told me about the details of Dr. King's uh, meeting. His wife Sarah died there in Ghana, but he's still there, he's a dentist, he's not practicing. And he told me the details of the meeting. I wish I would have written down the names of all of those in the African liberation struggle that King met on that trip. Now how you tie this in, go to uh, blackamerica.com, go down to King's speeches, ask for the speech, uh, print it out, April the 7th, 1957, Dexter Street Baptist Church. A new nation is born. A new nation is born, okay? Go ahead, go ahead. Get that speech and then you share that speech with your children and say that when the teacher gives them this assignment, bring back something for King's holiday, then you have the babies to bring back King in Africa and talking about the importance of building Africa in a nation for black people, okay? So I, I have to mention that. Now, let me try to walk through this quickly because any general who's fighting a battle, if you're a smart general, unless the fight is forced on you, you always choose a battle that you can win so that you can inspire your troops to move on. Now, when I was in Liberia, I know people criticized Minister Farrakhan for his relationship with Charles Taylor, but Charles Taylor was no poop butt. He was very smart. He made, and, and look, in those positions, you have to understand those positions. They got an institution here in, at Harvard University where they pluck African leaders and bring them there, give them a six months course on how to run a government. These people don't know anything about the mechanism of putting together courts and laws and economics and governments. And when America picks a leader that they want to promote, such as the brother in Zimbabwe, what's his name, who's in opposition to Mugabe? Shangarai. Shangarai. Shangarai took the course at Harvard. And the Americans put the money behind him and gave him a course and how to run government. This Negro don't know how to run a government, so the Americans tell him what to do. So, and, and I'm saying this to say that Charles Taylor understood certain dynamics. You know, when we met with him after he came to power, now you have to understand that if you want to get a real picture of Liberia, there's a book by a man named Hyman, H-Y-M-A-N. It's called U.S. Policy Towards Liberia, 1822 to 2003. And if you read that book, it will open your eyes. Charles Taylor told me, he said, any Negro that comes to Liberia according to our Constitution, if we haven't changed it, is entitled to land. That's why when the Hebrew Israelites brothers went there in 1967, they didn't turn you down or anything. 
they let you come in and sell. Right. So Liberia is rich. Now, the 1997 election in Liberia, America told him when he was about to seize Monrovia, it was going to be a bloodbath. If you come out of the bush, have a fair election. They put in an interim government with Amos Sawyer for a while on the five council. Whoever wins the election, we will back them to rebuild Liberia. Because Liberia was the number one CIA headquarters. Here in the book, when you read about how Doe got in, and how Doe and uh, Reagan, and how the money that Reagan put behind Doe, Doe couldn't run a dog catcher's house if he was trained to do it. But yet still he was the head of government of a, a, a country in Liberia. But it was the number one headquarters for the CIA in Africa. All of the Coca-Cola bottles made for all of West Africa were made in Liberia. All the, the currency in Liberia was the American dollar. So people from all over Africa came to work in Liberia. They had been tapped the diamonds that are in Liberia, not Sierra Leone. They have uh, iron, bauxite. They have a tremendous timber. And here's Firestone was treated like a giant plantation to get rubber to turn the wheels of American uh, car industry. Now, let me say this. I know my time, but I got to get to this. There's a book called The Bells of Shangri-La by a white boy in Greenberg, New York, uh, named uh, Abrams. He was one of those who took the American soldiers to Liberia during World War II. Ozzy Davis was one of them. And they were taken there under the false pretense that Hitler was going to take over Liberia, get the rubber tree plantations, and uh, have the rubber that America needed in order to win the war. So here's a private entity, a private entity. I'm glad you mentioned Cheney. Firestone Rubber, who brought a million acres for three cents an acre and treated the Liberians like they were slaves. So now Firestone Rubber convinced Franklin Delano Roosevelt that we need to protect that and I need the army to do it under the pretense that we're protecting it for uh, because the Germans are going to take it over and use black soldiers who were led by white officers. And if you read that history, it will blow your mind of how they set up brothels for the brothers and got the uh, African women so that they would be like uh, sex slaves for them. And white officers was over this whole operation there in the country of Liberia. So now, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is the president. She's a woman and she's an economist. Went to Harvard. Uh, Bush fumbling the ball when he left the American soldiers on the trip off the coast of Liberia and all of those people got killed, committed millions of dollars to rebuild Liberia. Now I met with her, her chief of staff used to eat at my house every night. There's a woman that I know and her family, I helped them when I, in Ghana, because thousands of Liberians were in Ghana in, in, in ref, as refugees. Brother Harold was sitting here, I took him to the refugee camps in uh, Ghana. So I told them that, look, in this rebuilding process where millions of dollars are gonna be spent, we need black Americans involved. We need to get all of these business people, lead, and we need our doctors, because these young boys that start killing at 14, they've been psychologically damaged. As all of these young boys that's coming home from Iraq right now, their minds are messed up. They're crazy as road lizards. They gotta be in counseling every day. So we need, I got two minutes to go, we need to make sure that we are on the page. How do you get on the page? You don't get on the page by having a meeting and open and talking about a bunch of niggas that ain't doing nothing, excuse the expression. I promised the sisters I wouldn't use that. But the way you get on the page is that you petition and say, look, we don't want white uh, contractors. We don't want Halliburton rebuilding Liberia. You settled Liberia to get rid of us. And if Liberia is going to be rebuilt, we got to be on the page. And you got to get these uh, congressmen to lobby these Republicans that if you're going to get firms and uh, you're going to get doctors and you're going to get teachers and you're going to rebuild this country at the tune of billions of dollars that Bush committed.
committed to the rebuilding of Liberia, then we want to see some black faces in there. We want Africans in the diaspora to be involved. That's a battle that we can win. And when you win that battle, you bring a level of consciousness about Africa to our people. Let me close on two things, and I know I only got two minutes. Tony <laughs> Torrey, when I first moved to Africa, and if I get time, the story of me living in Africa is a most interesting story. Now, the doors of African governments have opened up to Minister Farrakhan. You know that on the Tavis Smiley show, he, he gave the metaphor that America's on fire. She's on fire because of Katrina. She's on fire because this reckless war that Bush is engaged in. She's on fire because now she's got cultural imperialism going in the world and the people are beginning to see her. So America says she's, Minister Farrakhan said she's on fire. And all he said was let her burn. But everybody started running scared. He didn't say burn the house down, he said let her burn. She started her own internal fire. Now, but you know, it's like Malcolm used to say about the house Negro and the field Negro. The master's house catch on fire, the house Negro, he's getting buckets of water and running around because he know the biscuits and the chicken that he's getting and the care that he's getting for his he got to put out the master's uh, fire. But the slave in the field is saying, I'm praying God would send a wind, send a strong wind and burn the master's house. So, let me say that. So there's a controversy going. The minister don't want to hurt Tavis and the other brothers and all of that because he's trying to cultivate them and bring them to a level of consciousness. He's not trying to hurt them as they say he hurt Reverend Jackson in the campaign and all of that. But one thing that you got to say that the nation of Islam is not we. You know, we got to stand up for some principles that we believe in. So let me say this quickly and I'm going to close it out. Doctor, uh, I got two minutes. Okay? Yeah. It's a Baptist preacher's two minutes. <laughs> Let me say this and I want to close it out. Brother Kwame Torre, who I love dearly. In, 19, in 1972, he used to beg us, y'all got to open an office in Africa. So by the time, and I want to tell you how Dr. Collett was originally going to Africa. Then he got in some trouble here in Atlanta, had to go to jail, so I ended up being the one. Because Jerry Rollins was pressing the minister, if y'all want to have an impact on Africa, why don't y'all open the office here in Ghana? So we opened the office. Kwame used to come to my house and stay with me and give me African lessons, some of them are, are priceless, and his experience of living in Africa and how to handle yourself on the African continent. So Kwame made some tapes, and uh, I'm saying that these CDs are outside. We, are, we have them only because we recorded Kwame. I made some uh, talks around the country on doing business in Africa. There's a spirit to doing business in Africa. It's not just, and you can't do it remote. The, we have a tape about the land that the airways, my daughter married an airway in Ghana, and uh, my, when I moved to Ghana, I introduced my children to Ghana. Uh, two of my daughters ended up marrying men from Africa, and one is teaching in an international school, and she wouldn't go nowhere else but Africa. She's traveled all over Africa. And, uh, and I, thank, I thank God for it. Now, we're going to Cuba, God willing, in a, a week or two. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I love what uh, Brother Ilonga said. Uh, we're going because Fidel has invited the minister to come down. Because if we're going to work these ministries that he announced at the Million More Movement, we got to know how these ministries can serve the needs of our people. And there's no better country in the world than Cuba to find out how their ministry serves the needs of people. So we're going to, God willing, we're going to uh, Cuba to find out so that we can service the needs of black people in America. So in Kwame's uh, talks to me, Kwame told me about Guinea. Who said leave the wealth in the ground? Who said it? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. J said that, who said that?